On the podcast today, we're going to speak about the fourth state of consciousness, known as the Turiya in Sanskrit, and this makes up some of the essential aspects of uh, Vedic knowledge, but when we think about consciousness itself, this is a very important study to understand, and it's the fourth state of consciousness, so what are the, the first three? So the first three are uh, the waking state of consciousness, the dreaming state of consciousness, and the dreamless deep sleep state of consciousness. And then we find this fourth state of consciousness, the turiya. So the first three state of consciousness are related to the experience and appearances of reality. And so we find this knowledge particular particularly in the mandukya upanishad uh, and the upanishads in general and i highly recommend actually this version of the mandukya upanishad because it has gaudapada's karika and that gaudapada is shankara's uh grand guru you could say teach uh, his guru's guru and say so you have gaudapada's uh karika here so his commentary on the mandukya upanishad and also Shankara's commentary. So this is a p- part of a whole Upanishad. Yes, of yeah. course, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. The Mandukya Upanishad is one of the uh, yeah, important Upanishads. Yes. And so we find uh, Turiya in that. Mm-hmm. So, but this version here has the the uh, Gadapada's Karaka and also Shankara's commentary. Commentary as yeah. well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's not just like reading the Upanishads plainly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just text. Just, just text. Yeah. 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 Actually, this is this text actually makes up a lot of uh, Advaita Vedantic thought, like kind of core of um, yeah. philosophy, you yeah. could say. Essentially, yeah. yeah, core of the philosophy, and yeah, well, that's it's basically yeah where a lot of Advaita thinking comes from, non-dual thinking, and right. even though you would say that the Upanishads is about non-dualism itself, mm. it's it uh, it came about that later on. Uh, a lot of the deeper elements and the details of the Upanishads and the Vedas and that were exposed by Shankara, Gaudapada and these sorts of individuals. So a lot of the deeper knowledge got lost for you know centuries and centuries, but then they, they revived it essentially. And, that, and this is basically what's become uh, the Ramakrishna mission and the Vedanta society and... Mm. This is basic, basically based on, on Gautapada and Shankara's. Vivekananda. Yeah, Vivekananda, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's essentially a lineage of uh, Shankara, Shankara's lineage. Lineage, like, yeah. which is yeah, Mandukya. Mandukya Upanishad. Upanishad and, and, yeah. mm. and there's heaps of other, uh, other texts that yeah. Shankara has, like the, the Viveka, Judamani, uh, the Atma Boda, mm. these sorts of texts that are very important for people to understand and actually get into the Turiya as well. So, But... Yeah, this, this text is very important. And I'll, I'll read actually just briefly the seventh part of the Mandukya just to get people's understanding of the Turiya. But this is kind of a little bit abstract, Yeah. this this one. like mm-hmm. So it says here, Turiya is not that which is conscious of the internal subjective world, nor that which is conscious of the external subjective world, nor that which is conscious of both, nor that which is a mass of all sentience, nor that which is simple consciousness, nor that which is insentient. It is unseen by any sense organ, not related to anything, incomprehensible by the mind, inferable, unthinkable, indescribable, essentially of the nature of consciousness, constituting the self alone, the self here being the Atman, negation of all phenomena, the peaceful, all bliss, and the non-dual. This is what is known as the fourth, Turiya. This is the Atman, and it has to be realized. <clears throat> so that can be a little bit abstract, but we'll, go, we'll get in a lot into that uh, later on. So uh, a lot of people have probably heard you and I speak say the Atman a lot in, mm. the, in the podcast, yes. and the Atman being the undifferentiated consciousness mm. at the core of all of our being, mm. our essential nature, mm. nature of consciousness. Yeah. Uh, it's not a subject. Mm. It's identical with Brahman, the mm. ultimate reality. And that is kind of the indescribable co- consciousness of Turiya that they're saying, the fourth state of consciousness, the ultimate state of consciousness. Yes. 
I think um, um, first and foremost, what we need to address is more thoroughly is that what you mentioned earlier about the three states of consciousness, right? Mm. Like you know, first, a, a waking consciousness, which is like just like when we are just just you and I right now. Yeah, that's Wakeness, right. Yeah. When we are just active and doing stuff, and mm-hmm. and uh, next uh, is a dream dreaming. Yeah. yeah, dreaming state, which is. Um, the level of dreams. Yeah, level of like a somewhat. I guess you can interpret it many ways. In, in dream like uh, sleeping in a dream, or <laughs> somewhat you could also say that uh, we are awake, but yeah. we are also dreaming. Dreaming, meaning yeah. that we are somewhat like um, our um, perception and vision is obstructed by all these um, medias and uh, this brainwashing information and whatnot. Mm. Also conditioning as well, obviously, mm. so that we were, uh, we are, we all to kind of designed to act certain way from the birth because of our cultural um, learning process, which can be also um, somewhat like a kind of dreaming state, yes. right? Yes. It's not purely awake, purely awake meaning that like, uh, yeah, again, we will, we're going to get into that, but mm-hmm. the purely um, awakening uh, state is the uh, perception that coming from a Turiya state of mind, yep, right? Yep. Yeah. So that, and a dreamless sleep is, um, there is no like this or that. It's a non dual state of mind, right? Mm-hmm. But there, it's still kind of um, experiential. That There's a knower of the experience. Oh, right. The knower still exists and dream. So there is a sleep. subject and object that's There's, still kind of. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, well, there's so essentially, if there's still a subject, there's still an experience, right? You know, so mm-hmm. that's we'll get further into that yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. But the the idea, like when Shankara and Gaudapada are having a conversation, Gaudapada explains that to to Shankara. But you don't, because because Shankara is thinking like what you and I are saying. Like mm. uh, it is actually Gaudapada is saying it is a non-dual experience. Yeah. But it, the, the problem there is it's still. Uh, it's still like the I am Brahman. It's still like the, the there's an I. There's an I like still it, yeah. residing in that dreamless, deep sleep state of consciousness. Even though that most of us would say, when you are in a dreamless, deep sleep state, you you some of, we don't remember it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But but as a lot of great Advaita teachers would say, when you come out of the experience, how do you know you're in the experience? Mm-hmm. You see, like even though you di- you didn't have like a residual memory of the actual experience but when you came out of sleep from that sleep you can report back that you actually were in that Uh, dreamless deep sleep state mm -hmm. so there was in some sense a a knower of the experience Mm -hmm. and so like what i read there with the with the manduki upanishad it's kind of like the state of the turiya is even the knower is is it's gone. gone. The, ex- the experiencer is even essentially gone. Like the I is gone, essentially. And you are just, it's, oh, that's difficult to say, right? Because mm-hmm. like they say in the text, it's incomprehensible. It's, it's uh, indescribable. It's mm-hmm. hard to explain that state of consciousness. Mm-hmm. You could say that you are everywhere as everything, but that would even be, inac- that wouldn't be accurate as well because to say everything implies there's other things and... Yeah. So forth and so on. And also, uh, there is this interpretation of the symbol of Om, right, Mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Because that symbol of Om represents all that fourth state of consciousness, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And and, uh, we spell it like some people spell Om as Mm O-M, or some people do A-U-M. But I think maybe A-U-M might be a bit more accurate. Yes, yes. So, like when we say Om mantra, Om A means O. We we um, it's the start of the uh, the what is yeah start of the mantra. Same so that is which represents a yeah a waking state, mm-hmm. and U is a, what, a dreaming state, and M Om is a dreamless sleep, but then what the silence. That silence is what represents the Turiya state of uh, consciousness, right? Yes. Yeah. I think the first time when I came across this um, 
uh, interpretation was by Joseph Campbell's Joseph Campbell, um, yeah. lecture. Mm. Like, I mean, we were very familiar with the Om symbol and the mantra Om from visiting India and staying in India for a while. But when I actually was uh, saw that interpretation by Joseph Campbell, it was a bit like a kind of mind blowing because I, well, I mean, like never questioned the, the simple symbol from the start, and yes. even like how A U M and the silence, what they all represent, is so like profound. It was very profound for me. Yeah, mm. remember I got I got into that. In the older lecture, I did the Sacred Sound of Creation. Yeah. We were talking about that a long time ago, and yeah, it is so, it's so, it is so profound because you go through all of the four stages uh, are within the mantra. Like, and as any guru or, or good teacher will teach you, when you are reciting Om, it's like you're trying to feel that experience of going through the states and going through the stages of experience to the uh, the essential realm of. Where the experience doesn't exist, the not the non-experience and the non-experiencer, so to speak, mm. you know. So, mm. and that is one of the, the uh, important interpretations for for Turiya because then you can understand that Turiya itself is not like something uh, in the realm of uh, manifestation, like because we could say silence is like is kind of beyond the manifest world in some sense, right? It's beyond the manifest world. It's beyond, uh, uh, what do you say? Like, I shouldn't say logical interpretation, but it's something that a lot of us run away from. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, right? Like a lot of us run away from the experience of silence because we want to fill our mind up full of experience. Yeah. And so that's why meditation and, 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 and a lot of meditative practices are coming back to a f familiarity and uh, a comfortability with that silence because that's actually your original state of consciousness and the experiential realm is like this this kind of covering on that so to speak you know the covering on the turiya and there's something for me so i found so interesting that like because uh when we think of turiya studying turiya uh, is to focus back to the experiencer, right? Mm -hmm. More than experience itself. Yes, yes, that's right. But nowadays, we just, like, kind of chase just experience mm -hmm. just to, like, yeah, for the sake of entertainment or just to uh, get over your boredom or something. Mm -hmm. Just the experience itself would give it too much um, importance, I think, yes. outwardly. Instead of focusing back on ourselves, right? Mm. So that going back to the source of that experience, who is experiencing that experience? <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. So that's something like we all need to step back and think of, think about. Well, that's one of the crux of of Aita the dancer, right? The seer and the seen. So there's the seen, there's the, <clears throat> there's the experience, but who is the seer of the experience? Who is that? And you know. And that's why in India you have Rishi, right? Rishi means in Sanskrit means great seer. So the Rishis, the original Sapta Rishis who created the, uh, who are the, 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 the sages that the Vedas came from, they were the great seers of this reality. That's why what, a great sage, Ramana Maharish, yeah. is also Maharish, came from yeah. that. Yeah, Maharishi, yeah. Maharishi, yeah. Maharishi. Yes, the great, the gr yeah, great, great seer. Great seer, great seer. Came yeah. From that. That's yeah. right. And so Rishi means, yeah, the one who who can see, yes. the one who has seen the reality. That's you know that's a that's a great point, mm -hmm. and that's uh, part. You know, like I said, the crux of Advaita Vedanta is to get back to that state of the great seer, mm -hmm. and. That's uh, the work that we all have to do through meditation, through self-inquiry, and through understanding this sense of self we believe we are. And so it's, it's almost like a turning away from all experience, so to speak. So, you know, science, for example, right? Science focus on the experiential realm. And there's only certain particular sciences, really odd sciences, like maybe quantum physics and, and sciences like that, that focus on the observer, 
they're, they're not really vested into the actual experience because you know a lot of what we experience in some sense has or i shouldn't just say has been explained but we can understand why we experience you know through our sense organs and so forth and so on but who is the actual one experience and what is that sort of pure consciousness at the essence of our being mm. now the arguments in science as you know because my science is somewhat material based is that the experiencer and the observer are related to the body they're, they're just part of you know brain chemistry and you know, pure awareness, this idea of pure awareness is just a fancy Eastern idea. But as you and I know, and probably everyone listening and watching, is the spiritual ideal of the East is pure awareness, is to get back to that actual pure awareness. So everyone who's practicing Hatha Yoga, Tai Chi Chuan, uh, Zazen, all of this is all about getting back to that pure awareness, about that, that original state of consciousness that we all are and we always will be, but we are, you know, the, 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 ex the experience of life and conditioning and everything is caked over this. And so the, the spiritual ideal of this is, is, is that. And so it's somewhat, a, a, you know, it, it's a reverse sort of mentality than science itself because they're not worried about the experience. You know, of course we experience, but who's the one who experiences? That's what's important. That's right. It's a very co foreign concept uh, in the West, isn't mm, it? Mm. Like, like you mentioned, the uh, uh, science, uh, material science itself, mm. is focusing on primarily experience itself mm. and study that experience, and also Christianity as well. It's more so um, the ethical based religion mm -hmm. which is more so to do with the uh, outward experience of life right it's not to um, focus back on ourselves and then you know, transform ourselves mm. within uh, that's not kind of a um, goal or focus so that is something very foreign idea i think but uh, it had been around for thousands of years in the west and, and in the east eastern um, philosophy and it it reveals a lot of um, unanswered questions, I think, mm -hmm. from this philosophy when we question what's the fundamental um, self, what is the, who is uh, who are we basically this this, uh, this kind of question that uh, the, this uh, philosophy answers all those um, questions, I think. Of course, yeah. And these are the deeper elements of those Eastern spiritual traditions too. Like a lot of people will say, because a lot of people follow Hinduism, right? And, and they uh, they want to get to the deeper understandings. But there's different schools, right, of thought. But one of the, the deepest schools of thought that most actually Indians want to learn about is Advaita Vedanta. But it's also the same in Buddhism. Like when you see Buddhism, there's uh, the, in, in Mahayana Buddhism, because uh, the way Mahayana Buddhism and also Vedanta evolved, there's you know there's a lot of conjecture about someone they may have stole some of their ideas and so forth and so on. We don't want to get into any of that. There are some uh, very interesting similarities, especially when we talk about Turiya and we talk about Shunyata, but that's for a whole other discussion. Uh, but at the same time, why I mention Buddhism is because like when you look at the Madhyamaka schools and Nagarjuna and and, and these individuals, it's it's a uh, even though they're all of these other religious tenets of, of Buddhism or spiritual tenets, uh, the focus is on what we're talking about is, is understanding the, the actual experience of this, the one who uh, witnesses the reality. So this is like, you could say the esoteric elements of, uh, of a spirituality in the East, but at the same time, most people have, like, have came into contact with that, but it's such a difficult practice to try and abide as the witness mm -hmm. and to to inquire into the nature of yourself. It's such a difficult practice because people are caught up in their own lives. And so when you mention the Turiya or you mention Shunyata to them, it's kind of like they know, like, you know, we've lived in India for quite a while and people know, but in general, it's usually only people uh, in close to, close to a guru or, or, or in certain spiritual schools in India that actually take this sort of, sort of knowledge seriously because first of all when you start to engage in this the sense of person that you think you are starts to actually 
dissolve a little bit. You may still have a social persona and, you know, a, a, a family persona and, you know, all of these things, but it's the energy of that persona is not as great as what, as what it used to be because the more you abide as the Atman, the more you are living in that ultimate state of consciousness, which is, which is uh, like what they say in, in uh, Hinduism and Buddhism, it's like a turning away from samsara. All you're doing is turning away. Like, a, like a, I heard a sadhu once say, he was asked that, you know, what do I need to do to, you know, to reach an under ultimate bliss and realization of moksha? And he just goes, turn away from samsara. And it's like, huh? Like, because it seems so simplistic. But what, what they mean by that is like a turning away from worldliness, a turning away from being caught up in the waking, dreaming and dreamless sleep states of consciousness. You're turning away and you're focusing more on the Torah, the ultimate state of consciousness. I think we all have experienced that state of consciousness when we are in deep meditation, for example. And you purely observe your breath and purely observe your senses mm. and the thoughts. And at the beginning, I guess you can start with anapanasati, which mm. is a breathing exercise. And then you will uh, be aware of that uh, thought come and go and our goal is to not to engage, just get sucked back into that um, thought, mm. but to uh, stay away from it and then just purely observe. Once we do that, it'll just kind of dissolve itself, right? It just kind of disappears like mm. ice in the warm water, right? Yes. And then, then you um, slowly get into that deep state of awareness, which is just purely sitting. You, you are purely there, like uh, there's no thoughts, there's no movement in your mind. It, uh, breath is very steady and deep and relaxed, right? And your uh, posture is nice and relaxed but straight, right? Yeah. And that state of... Um, you, so you're, you're like a, a pure witness mm. of uh, your own being, right? But our challenge is to stay in that state of mind in at all times right right now like in, in even when you are walking down the street or to the groceries uh, this is a challenge right so but con continuity of that witness state of consciousness mm. that's the challenge mm. yeah. and i think that what well this is especially what advaita vedanta say about that right uh is that it is a challenge, but what happens is is the more the more you abide in that fourth state of consciousness in the Turiya, the more you are the Atman. Uh, is the practice becomes so? For example, like when you are practicing Anapanasati or you're practicing some form form of meditation, it's it's it can be easy on the cushion, right? On the on the on the cushion or, or however you meditate, but when you go out into the world, it's not not as easy, and so. The way that Advaita would talk about it is that from the Turiya, you are you are witnessing right the other elements of experience. You're witnessing appearances and 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 all of these things. Now, the the role from or, or what actually happens in from the state of the Turiya is you don't identify with the contents of your mind. Mm. The, the mind still goes because because the thoughts and that that's just the nature of the human organism. Thoughts and 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 mind activity are always just. Uh, are sort of like wandering and ruminating on themselves, but the difference is is that you are not identifying with the activity, because what what happens invariably, right, is when you identify with activity, your mind wanders, you've lost five minutes, you've gone down the rabbit hole of whatever you were imagining or or whatever you were thinking about, like some sort of future concern. And I think what I find myself with that is that you be, you take that too serious. You start to taking business too serious, whatever you're doing, like <laughs> yeah. over start overthinking yeah. about everything, yeah. and yeah. you become too like stiff and yes. serious about things, which in the end doesn't mean anything. No, like because think about how many times, and we've all experienced this. Think about how many times where there's been a situation where you've had this situation, right, and you've experienced that. And then you start to think about every little thing from that experience and, and then you start to project into the future yeah. about things that don't even exist. Yeah. And then it comes to the next day when you may see that individual or you may uh, go back to your job and no one is 
on your page. It was just all in your head. Yep. So you created a, a, a world for yourself that didn't actually exist. And this is very important. That's a good point. And so if you continually identify with, these, with this mind activity and the contents in your mind, you're going to continue to create those sorts of imaginary uh, worlds that don't exist. They only exist in your mind. They don't exist in anyone else's mind. That's why we've had situations, right, where, we, where we've gone home and we're fretted about, like say if someone said something to us and we, we took it our own way and then we go back to work the next day and that person's perfectly fine and then and in your head you're like... You're still somewhat disturbed. Yeah. That, yeah, and you're kind of like tripping out because you're like, how come they're not... And it's because you intuited it the wrong way. You didn't see it the way that they actually meant it or, or, or so forth and so on, you know what I mean? And so in some sense, our intuition lets us down in these situations. And you know, this is intuitive error. And, but then intuitive error leads to you know, uh, imagination, which leads to like false projections. And then... Yeah, because you, that all happens subconsciously, right? Without, yeah, without our control. Without our control, yeah. Mm. But the difference is, is when you've had spiritual training is the ability to witness that, yep. that, that problem. Yep. It doesn't mean a great master doesn't experience the same things that we experience. Of course they do. But the, but the difference is, as I said, they're not identifying with that activity. They see it. It's seen. That's what Rishi means. It's a, they see it. See right through the tra- transparency. Yeah. The transparency. It's essentially an object. Mm. Your mind activity, you have to see, this is where people have to think. It's an object. Because anything... That is an object can be seen, right? So I know that we can't we, physically we don't see our mind, but we see our mind f- from the witness state of consciousness. It's still an object, and if it's an object of knowledge, that means it's not the turiya. That means it's not anything to do with the fourth state of consciousness. It's just part of the the vrittis, the whirlpools of the mind. Yeah, like when you say object, like. Uh cup or microphone like something this is something visible Mm. but that's why i think we get tricked by our mind easily as well because it's not physically visible Mm. but if you're sensitive enough to your own mind whatever that arises and goes is not real not real no we can just consider it as that simple right Mm. like whatever and it just some thoughts are just coming. We all experience this coming out of nowhere, mm. and it arises. The problem is we get into it, right? And we like to, you know, juggle with it and like, you yeah, know, yeah. And you, play around with it. Yeah, play around with it, and you know, next minute just start thinking some completely unrelated, <laughs> right? But <clears throat> before that happens, we need to catch it, right? Mm. That's that's the also the process to get to that pure witness state yes definitely definitely we're just addicted to like you said juggling with it wandering with it we're addicted to the experiential realm and we, and actually this it's no one's fault because we've had no prior training you come into this world and you don't even have training wheels that's right there's no training wheels you're just sort of thrown onto a bike and you are said off you go and it's like yeah but you need training wheels to learn to ride a bike in general you know there might be some uh, people who are exceptional but in general we need a little bit of like understanding about what what the hell's going on here what is mind i remember i was about maybe 14 or 15 when i first heard someone say what is mind and it's interesting because you know as a teenager and even as an adult, a lot of people never hear this and they never even think about this because mind is something that they're just caught in. It's like the fish analogy, right? It's like fish are caught, fish dwell in water but never question the water that they exist in. We are all in mind and no one ever questions what this is. I was lucky enough to hear that when I was younger and it kind of made me think, but as a teenager, you don't think too much about it. But it, it, it does really you know, change your worldview and your orientation of what, well, what's going on here? Because like, what is mind? You know, I know that we're all here experiencing this reality, but like, what, what is this thing that we have? Like, 
we can tell anything about the body. We understand the body, the ligaments and, you know, the organs and we understand what our eyes are doing and all these sorts of things. But what is uh, the mind itself? What is consciousness? You know, what are these deeper questions? And so in coming into this knowledge, that's what that's what actually well, they call you know it's there's a lot of interesting terms for like Vedantas and and uh, Mahayana Buddhists, Buddhists and people like this is like uh, contemplative scientists. Mm. So, so and, oh, okay. and the laboratory is your mind. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not going to university to to study the the turiya. You're going into the nature of your mind. So. Something that I really love about over in like a Buddhist nations such as Thailand, Lao. Uh, Myanmar, India, of course, Nepal, and those countries. The, the at a very young age, we were talking about like age five, six, seven. That age, they get introduced to this uh, spiritual practice, mm. which is, I think, uh, it's very good, mm. and they get to um, have uh, an experience to see their own thoughts mm. at that young age. It's such a good um, kind of training to be present mm. as much as they can, and th- in that from that place, I think a child can be a much more calming and um, peaceful um, person. Mm. I think in yes. the future, yeah. So, which is actually important to again everybody. Yeah. But again. We not first of all, our parents are not very aware of that kind of things, no. so that we have no chance basically. No. <laughs> yeah, no. but it's uh, earlier we get exposed to these knowledge and um, practices. It's better for our own well-being and um, to pursue the absolute uh, happiness. Well, it's interesting because in uh, modern education, you learn about the body. Right? You're learning about the body, you're learning about biology and these things, but you don't learn much about the mind, if anything, really, like even all the way through high school, right? And you would only learn anything about the mind if you chose a particular uh, study at university. So, and uh, there's, you know, like, we've seen many situations where, uh, for example, like in Bhutan and Nepal and Sri Lanka and places like this, Thailand, people will sometimes it's usually poorer families too who will put their son into a monastery from a very young age too we're talking like six the the boys might go in but I've seen guys who have been in there since six and then they're 30 years old and just the you know the the presence of them the not the the the, you know the, the deep listening the the peace, like they just have, they have it, you know what I mean? They've been in some sense following that path for 20 years and that's become their way of life. Yeah. Instead of you and I, we're brought up in, in modern education and you go through the rigors of society and working life and sometimes you can come out of that a little bit twisted and bent. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's why, that's why in like some schools of, especially Advaita Vedanta, they won't allow someone older than 30 to learn. Mm. Yeah. And it's not because uh, it's, uh, they, they dislike anyone over 30. It's because that from uh, the traditional knowledge is that if someone has gone through the rigors of society, their samskaras are too strong after 30. It's almost hard for the samskaras, the mental impressions and subliminal imprints, to be sort of purged out so their vasanas their habits and tendencies are so bad that's not a general way of thinking in Advaita Vedanta but there are some schools that there are a minority there are some schools that uh, come from that place because you know the, the people have been too contorted and you know like they're a bit worn Going out Gone through a bit too much too much yeah <laughs> And they may, and some of these monasteries may have had experiences too with some of those people who have come in with their bad habits, probably drinking and being abusive. And so then you just sometimes you've just got to draw a line in the sand, even though it, it may not be beneficial. I mean, even though most people over 30 are not, you know, not like that, not like mm. that but 
but they may have had a lot of experiences. Like I guess that. the point is that by that age, that your conditioning is way too strong and thick, yes. so that it's hard to um, reverse it from mm. their point of view. I yep. guess that's the reason why. Well, it's like learning a language over thirty. Mm. When you start to learn a new language over thirty, when you're over thirty, right? It's a it's a different ball game. It becomes more challenging. Because you're hardwired. Yeah. But if you if a six year old starts learning a second language. Oh. Yeah. It's by more, more by their ten, they're fluent. You know, so mm. it's not. You know, it's um. That's one of the 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 problems with dwelling uh, being conditioned by society and socialization is that you are you know in relation to especially what we're talking about there's only a focus on the the experiential realm of consciousness and not the one who is experiencing not the witness of of the reality and i know that that is very odd to talk to modern people about because when they think of the witness as we mentioned with science when they think of the witness they just think that it's just a a blank state of consciousness that you can just tap into because that's just brain chemistry and that's just the way the mind is. But as we know, there's been extensive studies in, in quantum physics and, and neuroscience and, and all this and that, and there's, a, there's what, whatever it is, there's some sort of power in this pure awareness that this fourth state of consciousness that uh, is the witness of all. But we're not creating any vast studies about this state of consciousness yeah in quantum physics um when they talk about the observer and um the, what electrons in their mm -hmm. in their um experiment yeah like so when there is no observer these electrons are everywhere mm -hmm. like so i would want to call that it's kind of in, in, infinite possibility yeah. it's kind of infinite, infinite potential, pot poten potential yeah. there mm. so it's a kind of field of electrons just moving everywhere wherever mm. it needs to be whatever but once the witness comes into place it it forms in a certain way mm. Mm. so the turiya is the place where there is only the electrons that lying around everywhere mm. that's infinite uh, with the infinite infinite yeah infinite pot realm. potential <laughs> there yeah. and from that place of course there is an immense mm. power and mm, mm. um, the secret is that we every single individual has that ability to tap into that mm. realm mm. of consciousness yes but only because we are wind up with this um, daily life of dramas and things that our vision is so polluted and so distracted especially in these, these uh, day and age right 100%. so that that's the witness or observer itself is like you said about mind what is mind that question is just kind of like skipped and bypassed very long it's not even on the table yeah it's not even like for some people maybe never even thought about right mm -mm. <laughs> like yeah. the example when i mentioned to my father in the like long time ago when i first got introduced um, buddhist, <laughs> buddhist uh, meditation <laughs> and i told him um my experience that i had in the monastery right mm. <laughs> And I mean, like him being just an ordinary person living in society for his lifetime. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to see the mind? <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, would say, I guess that's just kind of innocent, yeah. innocent and uh, it's kind of normal, you can say, right? N normal. Um, normal if you've never been introduced to the That's knowledge. what I mean. Yeah. yeah. It's not nothing that's um, strange about it. But the thing is, our goal should be to go back to that. Um, origin of our um, existence, exactly. the consciousness, right? Exactly. It, this sort of like spiritual study and spiritual practices to get back to the Torah, back to the Atman, has really only been uh, attractive to peculiar characters. <laughs> you and I, people, people, <laughs> peculiar, the people listening and watching now, like. People who are really actually serious about 
spirituality and what the East has to offer. No new age nonsense and stuff like that, but real traditional knowledge and stuff that actually works. You know, it's been tried, it's been tested for thousands of years and it works. It's not, there's no guesswork here. And the knowledge is true because we have all of this thousands of years behind us. That would be like questioning science in the year 4000. It wouldn't make sense because the scientific uh, method works to a certain degree, you know, in understanding the material world and so forth and so on. So to question that, you'd be actually foolish. So likewise, we don't question this knowledge. But it becomes, like what I said, like not many people think about what is the mind like your father. And uh, in hearing that, it's a strange question, right? Like, you, 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 never, you have never considered what it is, like fish don't consider the water in which they live. And so we just take the experience of life for what it is in general. M most people, right, uh, will take the experience for what it is and they will, they're on the battlefield then of mind because then you've, that's where all conflicts arise from. That's where all disagreements or uh, all momentary states of happiness, all of these place, all of these states of consciousness happen in that experiential realm and can't give you that ultimate bliss, that ananda, because it's associated happiness. It's, it's, asso it's all associated with the experience, see? And Turiya uh, is unassociated. It's not associated with anything. This is why, like, there's some sages will say, you know, the seer, there's the scene, there's a seer in the scene, but can you see the seer? So you go into a deeper level, and some people would say that, well, you're getting crazy here. This can be an infinite regress, but it, it's not intentionally meant to be an infinite regress. It's it's meant to be like like with that Mahavakya, where do you have the the I am Brahman, that Mahavakya. But when in understanding that Mahavakya, that that great uh, Vedic saying is I doesn't. You have to have the I in Brahman without the I, right? There's no I, so there's just Brahman. It's like what you said before with the electrons, right? Turi is that state, and it's it's funny because when you're the witness, you see, um, you know, the objective world. You see. Uh, particular yeah, thing, form and particular yeah. things but when there's essentially when the the witness even the witness has dissolved yeah. into that ultimate right. state of consciousness there's just you can't it's explain it just it there's just brahman yeah. there's just Tao. it's just what it is just the inf infinity infinity yeah. yeah and you live from that state and this is where you see sages and sadhus and that where their eyes are completely blissed out and they're they look like they're stoned, but they're not. You know, they don't, they don't smoke, and it's just it's a state of conscious, a state of consciousness from not uh, associating with reality. There's no association because there's no sense of I that dwells within them anymore. You can only associate with the experience, right, when you have a sense of I, because I is the one who who is associating with the reality. But as you dissolve the I and the vrittis, and in doing so, the vrittis of the mind begin to settle then that's where the sense of persona or i begins to dissolve though you could say okay there's still the witness there but then even that in some sense evaporates too there's i wouldn't even it's, it's hard to describe that experience because it's it's beyond like a logical thought but beyond logical reasoning yeah well some people say like just a pure easiness mm. Because they're Isness, yeah. pure, purely ease. It just is, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why pure awareness is one of the best. You know, just just there's just awareness. Like it's not like. I mean, it. You can say like you're just splitting hairs here, right? Yeah, witnessing state of consciousness. You have awareness, right? Awareness meaning mean. There's just awareness. Like it's just like your eyes are open, but you're not. You don't see colors, or you don't. There's no focus on objects. Now, no, I'm talking. I'm using that as a an, as an example. I'm not meaning that literally, but like from a state of consciousness, there's that that sense of uh, complete uh, absorption or unification with the Brahman, with that with that ultimate reality. 
which is which is again is unassociated like ananda in sanskrit a lot of people confuse this term because they think ananda means uh bliss and joy in the sense that we experience bliss and joy in the experiential realm it's not that it's not that it's not, it's not associated happiness it's unassociated the, the bliss, the ananda arises when you cease associating with things and with experience. Yeah, that blissful state is, I think, something that we could experience when we kind of give up everything. Yes. We completely, like, uh, empty our mind. Mm. Like, yeah, cease all desires and thoughts and whatnot. Mm. And, like, when you kind of just completely give up and just just when you you just drop everything mm. right and just that there's a pure there's that nothing less there's nothing that you can associate with or identify with mm. and from that place if you can reside in that place for long enough then we will all be able to feel that what that blissful, the true sense of ananda, I think. 100%, yeah. 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 Well, that's what yeah. people have been doing for thousands of years. Yeah. Very rare beings have been doing for thousands of years. The, in the Upanishad, also said, like, the, the cessation of all phenomena. Mm. Like, it's, it's just not, kind of, nothing, hap nothing is happening. No, right? no, yeah, yeah. Like, it's just purely, it's just pure present mm. state. In your mind, mm. in that that mind, that state of uh, presence is that I think it's true freedom as well. I think yes. real like a true sense of liberation, like not in terms of what we want to think of freedom in society. Mm. That's the kind of like really nothing can touch you, nothing can move you, nothing can persuade you. Right, mm. you're completely unconditioned pure, unstained, and you're purely there, right? Mm. And that, that's a pure, blissful, and very peaceful place mm. to be. Mm. And that is also a true freedom. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's like you said, beyond all phenomena, beyond mm. all of that. It's like when Ramana Maharshi was, was dying in Tiruvannamalai, and he was riddled with cancer, you know what I mean? Like, we're talking about the late 40s here so we're talking about you know rural india didn't have very good probably didn't have very good health care at that mm. that point in time and a lot of the devotees were so you know distraught and you know so he's their teacher you, you can understand it's it's innocent it's 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 sad it's yeah. sad yeah you know you've developed a relationship with a great teacher for decades and it was much more pure back in that time too spirituality wasn't you know commercial and and there wasn't all of these uh, pop gurus around. It was very real. And so uh, some of the devotees were like, I don't, you know, Bhagavan, I don't, I don't want you to leave and I don't want you to die and this and that. And Ramana kept saying, like, where, am, where can I go? And who is this I you're talking about? You know, where can I go? Like, you're talking as if, and like he was kind of saying to them, nothing, nothing ever happened. This didn't happen. Like, none of this that you think ever ever happened it's just an, the experience like it's not it's in the field of the experiential realm but what's really uh, within everything is the turiya is the atman that's all that ever existed but you've caught up in this you know the, the sadness of me dying and and life itself right like because uh, it, that is all part of phenomena. It's all part of the the changing reality. That is it. That is the experiential realm. But the changeless, at the core, at the heart of the universe, which is the universe, is actually all that ever is and ever will be. All of this, like if you know, if we're using Hindu knowledge, if we use the yugas, for example, what you and I are experiencing, everyone experiencing here, has been experienced millions and millions and millions of times through millions and millions of different cycles of the universe. So what's new? What's new, yeah. So what's always there is what we should always be f trying to abide as, as opposed to like, that would be like trying to like just look at the waves of the ocean without understanding that the ocean itself is 
is what gives the waves its power. You know, it's the the waves are just the, just a uh, just the the changing oceans. It's just like the oceans being the ocean being morphed into different shapes and this and that. And that's what our mind and our bodies and so forth and so on are. So Ramana was kind of saying, like, who is this I you keep talking about that that you're mm. sad about rolling out and who and where can I go? Because from Ramana's perspective, he is the Atman. There is no mm. they where to go. Only the I can go and the I will go when all of our sense of I will eventually evaporate. Yeah, it's a tough thing is that in, in experiential realm, we uh, inevitably develop this attachment to things. Yes. Whether consciously or unconsciously, we have, um, we develop this thing, the, mm. we develop the attachment. So the disciple around Rama was somewhat dis- uh, attached to his uh, physical presence, mm. right? Mm. Which is so understandable. Yeah, of and, um, it's not like it's a bad thing. No, yeah. And um, yeah, so that um, that he's about to, you know, depart this world, right? Mm. And it's kind of very human and actually very normal to be sad in a sense. But again, being uh, Ramana, being a great sage, what he said to his disciple, it just it's kind of so beautiful mm. in a way, isn't it? Like. Mm. Where can I go? Mm. Like, yes. it's always been here. It always will be here. Yeah. And I'd never departed. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. See, the accurate description of that would be the equipment of consciousness is departing the world. Departing the world. This localization mm-hmm. of consciousness you see, right? So you, you and I and everyone listening and watching, we're all a localization of consciousness. So this is the localization of Atman, Brahman, seeing the world yeah. and, experience, and, and having this uh, experience of the world. And this is the equipment of consciousness, the mind, the body. So all that's dying really is the equipment of that localization of Brahman is dying. That's the accurate description of for Ramana or for anyone. Yeah. And I know that you can't say that to anyone and you would not dare say that to anyone because you know grieving and this and that is necessary and death is necessary grieving is necessary you know so on so on so but if we wanted an accurate description we would say the lo- the, the the equipment is dying you know it's like throwing your laptop out the window but the internet still exists that's that's right yeah. you know you throw your laptop out the window off the yeah. 10th floor and smash it on the ground so what <laughs> I can get I can get another body, another laptop, and, and then internet still there. And then yeah, just uh, connect to that consciousness being uh, an yeah. online world, internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah we'll just use that as a as a description, yeah, as right? A, yeah, analogy. A, yeah. yeah. So that's what's happening. Mm. So you're basically throwing your body out the window, and I'm just going to get another one, be new and improved, probably, and mm. hopefully, hopefully the vasanas aren't strong and <laughs> samskaras aren't strong. Hopefully, I don't. Live a similar clean, yeah. clean memory. <laughs> memory is clean. The memory is clean. Empty. Yeah, hopefully I live a better life than the last one. You know, so, but that's a really an accurate description, right? The localization, uh, the equipment of the localization of consciousness, because all we are essentially is a localization of that one consciousness, and so that's what we have to remember, and that's what actually we are being taught in the Mandukya Upanishad and through the knowledge of Turiya. So essentially, when we look at the Turiya, we're, we're looking at going beyond all experience is, is kind of the essence of the fourth state of consciousness. Is there's a, a, an, a realm beyond the state of experience, but is, is imminent within all experience as well. Like the Atman is imminent within all experience, but also transcends the world. And when we talk about this, a lot of people... Uh, I've heard this in a lot of uh, Vedantic circles, let's say also Buddhist circles as well, and, and, and the, through the knowledge of Shunyata, where people will explain their spiritual experiences, right? So they'll explain like, 
maybe experiencing a state of light or bliss in their meditation or they'll explain their psychedelic experience where they had these certain states uh in in through the psych through the psychedelic experience and and i'm not saying that these aren't spiritual experiences but when we come to this sort of knowledge it's still an experience see and that's what's important and this is why i i've seen a lot of people get con like uh if vedanta is is really interesting right because it kind of throws it kind of stops you in your tracks where i've seen like there was a lady once talking to swami savapri nanda in los angeles and she was explaining like this experience she had and it was it sounded a little let's let's just say a little new agey like the way that she interpreted the experience and it, but it may have happened i'm not saying it didn't happen but but swamiji was like very blunt and just said that's still an experience though and it's but then he said i'm not saying that to upset you but from where advaita vedanta stands and this is also the stance of Mahayana Buddhism, is that that's still an experience. It's not the Turiya. It's not what's being explained. The Turiya can't be explained through experience. Mm. It ha you have to go beyond all experience. Atman is beyond all, e all sense of person, all sense of like what's happening out here. It's beyond all of that. Even though it's imminent within it, and this is all Brahman, but it's beyond, you know. Yeah, I actually wanted to bring that up because about the psychedelic experience, the near-death experience, and the LSD or uh, ayahuasca and out-of-body like, out experience, out-of-body experience. Yeah, that sort of, that sort of uh, um, psychedelic experiences. Like me personally, I never had any like some substances in, ever in my life. Like I never. I, by chance never really happened to me yeah. and I don't really look for it mm. and just yeah it just pan courses out. for courses yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. but when we, we've met many uh, yeah, course, people yeah. some of our friends had a um, good experience um, taking ayahuasca in uh, Peru or somewhere mm. like that mm, and it's uh, interesting and very I am actually curious but I still kind of like a uh, wondered if that experience is really like a, a effective to your own self transformation mm. because it sounds like it mm. because when they describe their own experience it's like there it's all love and there's all this um, beautiful uh, feeling and, and the mother earth and this and that mm. and it sounds really interesting and all those individuals who had that experience didn't seem like they wanted to get out of the uh, the trip, yeah, the yeah. experience, right? Mm -hmm. So I just often wonder, like, um, then have that have that experiences they had changed their life, mm -hmm. transformed their mm -hmm. life? Mm -hmm. Because I never experienced it. So mm -hmm. is it? helpful to your own um self and uh, spiritual um path uh, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. but uh, i think it's a uh, different by individual by individual i think some people may have uh, progressed in their spiritual uh, practice mm -hmm. from that experience as well yeah for sure and um, some people maybe just had a good time and just move on and mm. I wish they just wish to have it again type of thing. So mm. it didn't really uh, do much. Mm. You just kind of, uh, you go for a um, short holiday and come back and like, as if nothing happened, yeah. right? Yeah. But again, like when we focus on that uh, experience uh, more than experience itself, mm. The taking psychedelic is not necessarily will help everyone no. in the spiritual growth and may not be as effective as taking like a very intensive uh, sadhana, for example, mm -hmm. right? Because intensive sadhana is purely uh, focusing on your real self-work, mm. whereas psychedelics, you um, kind of depend on some substance. Yes. 
and it becomes, like you said, just an experience. Some of, one of the good experiences that you had, but that doesn't necessarily change uh, yourself, right? Well, it's like what Maynard James Keenan, lead singer of Tool, once said when he was asked about his experiences with psychedelics and acid and everything like that, was that because they asked him sort of like, why don't those experiences change lots of people? Like, right. And Maynard was like, well, they have no frame of reference. Because you know, like when you have to, when you when you engage in something, right? And and I, as you know, I've always harped on about this for years on my YouTube channel, about having a frame of reference before you, like, say, meditate and understand this knowledge. You need to understand the knowledge. You need to have a scaffolding to go deeper into whatever it is. And so people, by say by chance, might get uh, come across someone with DMT or something like this, but they don't have any sort of spiritual. Uh, background or don't have any grounding uh in in any spiritual knowledge to to understand the experience a little better and so a lot of those people may take psychedelics some will transform for sure but a lot will just go back to their normal lives and and Mm -hmm. and what you see in their life is nothing that's really changed fundamentally you know what i mean like so we've seen that because we've got friends that have changed from psychedelics and we've seen mm-hmm. friends that ha- haven't Head changed and they've gone just back to normal and, mm-hmm. and, and so forth and so on. You know, psychedelics is kind of like, you know, you can use psychedelics and meditation in, uh, let's say for example, you can compare them in tandem, right? Where you could say psychedelics is like uh, a shortcut to understanding yourself and, and peeling away the layers and going deep into your persona meditation does that but it can be longer term but the thing is with meditation uh it can give you more of a discipline disciplinary uh element in your kind of conscious effort conscious effort and there's a lot you have to put the work in where psychedelics can actually bypass some of that work for some people you know let's let's be serious here but they're both tools right Mm. they're both tools and so you know, you use the tools wisely. Uh, but yeah, like the, 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 there's there's problems if you don't have a frame of reference, especially with meditation or psychedelics. So uh, the ultimately the thing is, as I was mentioning, is psychedelics use, there's still an experiential element to it. So does that make it wrong? No, no, we're not. That all Vedic knowledge and that's not saying things like that are wrong but if you're trying to understand the Vedic knowledge and you try to understand Turiya and Atman and, and Brahman then you have to identify that it's still an experience and the, these tools like psychedelics and meditation are to get you back to that they're, they're pointing you in that direction to go beyond the, the nature of experience itself whatever that may be you know and so they're pointing you in that direction. But uh, a lot of people don't understand that. They don't understand that uh, as humans, like we, we have to, uh, what do they say in Taoism and Buddhism? See, they say, see your original face. Oh. So you're trying to see your original face. Essentially, that's what we're all doing. What we're, we're all supposed to be doing here is to come back to our original face, which is not the person, mind you. It's not your original face. It's all of our original face. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's Brahman. Mm. So, and that's what we ought to be doing. And so problems arise when you don't understand that sort of knowledge and you just take the, uh, whatever meditation you're doing or the psychedelic experience you, that you've had or the, that you, you've had continually and you haven't, in some sense, reoriented your focus into what's important. And, you know, we have had friends, for example, against Horses for Courses, where we've had friends that have had psychedelics first, and then mm. they've just fallen in love with Vipassana. Oh, yeah. So they've just done Vipassana, course after Vipassana course, and they're just, they're into the study of the mind. And so psychedelics, you could say, was very beneficial for them because it got them into... Look, you can't have psychedelics all the time, right? But you can meditate all the time and you can uh, inquire into your mind all the time. And then we've seen uh, the other way around where we've had, had friends that have practiced a Vipassana first and then they're uh, 
had attained deeper states of awareness, mm. but then they've taken psychedelics, which has also helped them as well, and mm. that's their path. You know, it's horses for mm. courses. But what we're talking about essentially is that that's all well and good because that can peel the layers of the persona back. That gives you an opportunity to even go further into the non-experiential realm. Mm. You know, well, uh, I think that um, frame uh, frame of reference. Yeah, frame yes. of reference. Yeah, that's something that's very important. I think because you'll have to eventually you will need to know what that was, mm. right? Yeah. Again, like it differs by individual, but yes. um, if you want to have, if you want to uh, keep that experience always there and also prolong that experience in your real life, mm. then you will need to find out what that experience was about, right? Yeah, of course, yeah. And to be able to do that, we'll have to. Um, direct to um, looking at uh, Eastern philosophy, and that's uh, and actually the core of it too, because that's the where all all there is. See, a lot of New Age Western spiritual people, right? They think that they don't need any scaffolding or framework, and then you see them come up with this really airy fairy spirituality and when you know them personally, they're the most ungrounded people and the most emotional people and they're definitely not spiritual. They just it's it's a it's a covering of spirituality. And so when you're talking about traditional knowledge and you're talking about like even taking psychedelics, because there is a little bit of a new age thing around uh, the psychedelic scene, but there is traditional psychedelic shamanism, right? Yep. And so you need a framework, man. It's like saying I want you to learn this language without learning the alphabet. So I want you to learn English without knowing A, B, C, D, you know, go, go on. Or most of you could say also without grammar. Without grammar, yeah. Mm. So you just, it's psychobabble. Like the, the B, it, do, for, yes, Toria. Like, I don't understand what the hell this guy's talking about. Yeah. The sentence Only that person is knows. <laughs> complete psycho babble. You know, so you have no frame frame of reference, no framework, right? So, for example, if you look at psychedelics, you see now around the world, this is really crazy in my opinion. People are buying like ayahuasca online and this and that and they're having ayahuasca parties in New York and stuff like that. No shaman there. Crazy, crazy stuff. I mean, you could say, oh, well, and good, they have all freedom to do that. Yeah. But the thing is, there are risk that there are people who have, you know, mm. suffer from like a yeah. mental problem. Well, there's, you know, what people don't talk about with psychedelics is there's a high rate of schizophrenia of yeah. people taking psychedelics. That's right. And a lot of people don't talk about that. Mm. That's taboo because maybe that conflicts with a lot of, you know, people who are trying to promote psychedelics as well but there are high rates of people who who suffer from schizophrenia yeah. so you can go and buy ayahuasca online right and have these little f fake ayahuasca ceremonies at your own home or you can actually go to brazil or peru or ecuador or anywhere like this and be trained by a proper shaman and and go through the actual ceremonial process because they're a teacher and a guide for a reason they know how to guide you through it and they know uh, they have a sense, an intuition and a sensibility about the actual person. Likewise, with the Vedic tradition or Buddhism or Taoism, you ought to learn from a proper teacher to give you the, the framework and so that gives you a frame of reference about the experiences you're experiencing. So, for example, you could read about Turiya, right? And you could have your own airy fairy understanding of what it is but you're not grounded actually in what it actually means and what the experience actually is but if you learn from a proper teacher who understands the knowledge and who also has experienced that ultimate state of consciousness then that's like a fast forward button on your pro spiritual progress that's right you know and that'll be a right path to and that's the right path right. yeah mm. Because we know that there's many fake gurus in the world and mm. spiritual teachers out there, New Age spiritual teachers who wax lyrical sometimes about this stuff, but they don't, they know they know nothing about it. 
you see them in their private life and it's all business. You know, they they essentially are like spiritual self help gurus. You know, so yeah, well, they use this knowledge for, to their advantage. To their advantage, yes, mm-hmm. f- for commercial reasons. Yes. So, but getting back to the knowledge we were talking about is that anything like that, like so, for example, you're in meditation and you're you're experiencing the thoughts of your mind and this and that is still an experience. Whether you're taking psychedelics and, and anything that you can report back to someone is still an experience. So Turiya and the Atman is beyond all experience. It's beyond the experiential realm. Mm. It's beyond the energy of the universe. So what we would call Prakriti in yoga, right? Prakriti is this soup of energy which becomes our vrittis in our mind, the whirlpools in our mind. So Prakriti is essentially all of the energy and the mind of the whole universe. But there's this Purusha it's pure awareness that's just sitting there in the background even though it's imminent through all of everything but it's just there just it pervades everything but it's just sort of just chilling in the background like you can tap into me anytime you want but you can't get it through experience that's right it's like there's a many layers of uh, consciousness Hmm. and then you kind of peel it off layer by layer and that uh, um, Turiya is at the right at the rock bottom of it, <laughs> and you need to dig into dig it into to it, yeah. access it. Right? Exactly, mm. it's the power base of everything else, but it's like <clears throat> you know, it's it's not it's it, it's not uh, something you will abide in by chasing it through experience. You know, so if you're in your waking state and you're sitting there like, I want to be the Turiya, I want to be the Turiya, <laughs> you're never going to be the Turiya. You know what I mean? Like, so it's uh. It's ironic because the the abiding in the Turiya comes through the the dissolution of the I mm. in dissolving your persona, and that's why, like a lot of the great traditions, the Av- Avaduta traditions in India, the Dattatreya traditions, the some of the you could say you know, toughest traditions to follow because mm. they are centered on the complete dissolution of the eye like just the destruction of your ego that there's just nothing left (laughs) like we could say like you know everyone watching listen you and i here we all still have ego because ego in a sense not that it's a bad thing but it's it has social utility right so we can communicate and the problem is when we over identify with it but when we look at the avidut traditions they're like get even get rid of that one just full blast that's why when you read the Avaduta Gita, it's mm. kind of like, you know, always you're unchanging bliss. Unchanging bliss, awareness. yeah, yeah. You're never mm. this person. It's all, mm. it's all BS. Get beyond mm. it. Get beyond it. Mm. It's just going to be a problem. You're unchanging bliss, nectarine knowledge, so forth and so on. Rubu Gita is like this as well, like, right? A lot of those s- southern Indian traditions are full hectic mm. dissolution of life. Yeah. Alan Watts once said that he thought that that was something to do with maybe the Invite the actual weather in South India because uh, yeah. South India is brutal with heat, and so if you don't get spirituality, if you don't get, you might get roasted. You might get roasted. So you you better get it ASAP. Mm-hmm. Whereas then, when you go to North India, where it's a bit cooler, you have more of the Vaishnava tradition. So you have more of the poetic mythologies of the Bhagavad Gita. You know, the Mahabharata. But then when you go to the south, you have the Rebu Gita, Avaduta Gita, Ashtavaka Gita. You have all of these ones that are just like... They, you get got, it now. Get it now yeah. like, or, or get out of here. Yeah. You're in the wrong game. And ironically, I started with the Avaduta Gita, so I went like back to front. You know? <laughs> I read like the Bhagavad Gita years later. So, And then when I read the Bhagavad Gita, I was like, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's good, but I, I really like the Avaduta yeah, Gita. Yeah. Mm. Um, mm. And Shaivism and, and the Avaduta Dattatreya path is about that complete dissolution of that that I, that ego, because from their perspective, all that ever is is the Turiya. All that ever is is that fourth state of consciousness. The experience itself is is Maya, is illusion. Yeah, it's um I think um interpretation of this spiritual path uh, differs 
by individuals experience and how they introduce to this path is actually very important because that kind of um that that introduction of this path so that the first impression right this first impression is very strong to everybody right 100% so that how you got in touch with this knowledge through Abhidhut Gita. And for myself, it's the same, like uh, straight into uh, Buddhist forest tradition. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't get much easier. Yeah, yeah. and you go in the cave and yeah, like, yeah, uh, yeah. no electricity, nothing, yeah. and just... Just stay quiet forever. Yeah, like just eight hours of meditation every day. And yeah. just, you, you deal with it, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. You deal with you it. You work it out. You work it out or you're out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This kind of stuff. Yeah, so, yeah. again, I mean, for me, the same. I, I like more kind of intense and more disciplinary um, practice because I feel it's most uh, rewarding of course yeah, yeah. yeah. It, well we know that it's yeah it's rig- maybe rigorous and uh, somewhat like it's really um, very effortful at the beginning mm. but at the end it gives such freedom meaning um, like it, it rewards is sweet like yeah, you, course, you, yeah. you get the core core of that practice yes like yeah, that's why yeah, I think that's why that the direct path is somewhat um, very important and very um, yeah medicinal as well. Well, that's, it comes back to why it's important to learn the traditional knowledge. Mm. A lot of people will come across, say, Taoism, Buddhism, Hinduism through like modern self-styled gurus or, yeah. or uh, spiritual charlatan teachers that are just uh, not teaching the traditional knowledge. And so you get like a half-baked uh, spirituality. You know, you and I have encountered this a lot on my channel where a lot of people say, oh, that's not Taoism. And they're talking about the Zhuangzi text. And it's like, the Zhuangzi is not Taoism? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Yeah. I mean, like, you. let's not get into the psychology of YouTube comments, but it's very eye-opening that people are not... Uh, people have a perception of what eastern spirituality is from uh, fake teachings of the traditions and this is very dangerous and this is actually uh, uh, indians have talked about this for a long time because of how hinduism and buddhism left kind of left india and has been reinterpreted in europe and north america especially to suit those cultures but that's not hinduism and not buddhism and they're not going to work because it's a re, it's a reorientation or uh, it's like a, a completely new set of beliefs. Essentially, there's actually people t- people actually term now American Buddhism like there's actually a term. So, which is very strange, right? Like because that would be like saying there's only one Buddhism. Yes, yeah, I mean that would be like saying there's an Indian Christianity. It doesn't make uh, any. If you said that, okay. yeah. Christians would probably say. What are you talking yeah, about? Because yeah. there's only Christianity. What are you talking about? Mm. But for whatever reason, Indic knowledge is allowed to be uh, imported to anywhere else in the world and just made their own way, you know, and it doesn't make any sense. And as you know, and we definitely know this because I've lectured around the world and this and that, and we've seen people who've come into t- contact with that sort of knowledge as opposed to the traditional knowledge. But even when they hear the traditional knowledge, when, when I'm lecturing, they're much more attracted to the traditional knowledge because it's different. It's, it's, it comes from a different cognitive style. It's exotic and it's completely different to Western thinking where the problem is with uh, American Hinduism and American Buddhism is that it's been altered to suit individual co- individualism. You see? Like I've had people say to me through the comment section, oh, but Taoism, isn't it about... Isn't it an individualistic path? No. You, you're doing the spiritual work, <laughs> but Tao is not... There's no such concept. The Tao is not like an individual. Mm-hmm. It's you, to get beyond yeah. your sense of self. You have to, to merge with the Tao. The person cannot exist. When you're reading the Tao Te Ching and you're reading the Zhuangzi, it's about the letting go of the sense of self you are because there's a social construct. Yeah. It's, a, it's a warping of your original nature, your original face. Mm. And so you have to get beyond that. 
Yeah, I don't know why it's because um, the concept of, for example, Turiya itself, maybe a little bit too abstract, and you need um, quite extensive uh, training to experience it. Mm. So before they even experience it, they um, kind of set up their own understanding of it, mm. and they kind of. They are, they misinterpret the knowledge and they spread yep. that misinformation, right? Mm. And that's how this all even uh, idea of yoga and things like in the West is very like warped, warped in yeah. a sense. That's um that's why it's it's very important to uh, look at uh, the, yeah again the traditional knowledge. You need to be very cautious of. Uh, who you are listening to, right? Yes, yes. For, for me personally, like, uh, okay, the Upanishad is the, mm, the core teaching of Vedanta, for example. Mm. Okay, then the, who wrote the Upanishad? This is my question. Yes, like, sure. who wrote it? Yeah. And then this and this and this and Shankara. And, mm. and then, okay, then... And who is Shankara? Like trace back and back mm, and back, and then you get to like at the bottom of it, and you go f- that, make that as a kind of kind of start point. Mm. Then you go from right from the bottom of it, mm. and then you make the your way up, right? Yeah, for sure. In that way, you you will get the, the original traditional philosophy of this knowledge. Yes, and I think that should be. The way for with everyone, everyone <laughs> who's interested in East, well, in especially in Eastern spirituality, because that is it. There is no other, yeah. right? Like because that is the origination of this Hindu Hinduism. This is a problem again. Just a whole other conversation, but the mm. online online world. Yeah, because anyone can put up anything on YouTube and uh, websites and can write all sorts of crazy things, mm. and then <laughs> mm. people believe it. Yeah, you know, that's that's how conspiracy theories start, right? Why do you think all of these conspiracy theories? There's so many in the world now, but before the internet, there wasn't. You know, it's the, of course, because there's free communication. People, uh, bad ideas are infectious, and so, you know, likewise with decent spirituality, people can create all sorts of interpretations and this and that. It's like an individual. On, wrote on my Kali Yuga video recently saying you're no expert and we're in Dwapara Yuga and this and that he doesn't even know that there's an ancient there's two different old things. yeah you know what I mean it's, it, and then I explained I wanted to explain that someone wrote before or whatever and then they posted some sort of Sadhguru link and Sadhguru is talking about y- y- Sri Yukteswar's one, you know, There's the same thing as what you were. It's too much to get into, you yeah. know. Like so, you first of all, they're not studying like how you said. You mm-hmm. want to get to the bottom of it. Yeah. They watch a YouTube video and their mind's made up. That's that's a terrible way of thinking. Yeah. Terrible way of thinking. It's very dangerous. That's a dangerous way of thinking because mm-hmm. that's not the way it is. This is why <laughs> you and I we preferred the world when there was no internet because. At least when there were, you know, certain knowledge in the world, you had to read and study and, it, you know, you had to, it wasn't built on YouTube clips. It wasn't built on someone's website that they can just spout any nonsense. Like, you know, when we were in India, for example, like, we love to go to books bookshops in oh, India course, and yeah. Nepal. Hmm. That's how we get to be in touch with knowledge mm. when we talk of knowledge mm. right mm. for example like when i was in university knowledge was only accessed from going to actually physically going to library mm-hmm. right there's lots of books and you can just pick and choose any book that you want to read to get into it and mm. or there is like old media Things like videos, documentary that you can access. At back then, like a YouTube wasn't, you know, what mm. it is today. Yeah. And like all these things, knowledge was 
uh, physically there that you had to go and access. So it's more like active in our way, in our end, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, for sure. It's now it's passive. Device is active. Mm. We are passive. Mm. We just sit there and then uh, to get, get your smartphone or laptop or whatever. You just do some touch, touch, mm. touch, and say. So it's completely different, and it knowledge is something that we need to like uh, put some effort mm. to it. Yeah, you know that. And from that way, the, you will find the actual the gem of knowledge. Of course, yeah. And this online culture no. of today is it's, it's trash. Yeah, definitely don't. Yeah. Especially if you're an intelligent person, don't mm. engage in that. Yeah. Read, read books. If you want to, if you want to understand the Torah, mm. go ahead and get yourself a copy of this. Get yourself a copy of the Manduki Upanishad with the Gaudapada's Karika in it read books by Swami Nikolananda, you know what I mean? Like translations by him and and go out and do the real work. Like, because what people see here on our podcast is that we've done all this work. We've done all this study. We've been schooled in this stuff for over 10 years. It's not like new to us. But what's frustrating is when, like I said with that comment, people make an offhanded comment, oh, I saw Sadhguru say this and this and that. Okay, if that's what you think, have you read the Puranas, mm. where the original knowledge of the mm. Yugas is? Have you read Sri Yukteswar's Holy Science? Mm. Don't even make a comment if you, have not, if you haven't read those, because you're not even in the game. And that's the problem with online culture, because you can just spout anything and just offhanded comments, insensitive, and you're speaking actually to strangers. There's no common courtesy. Yeah. And as an adult, I don't make a distinction between offline and online, so I treat people the same offline and online the same. If and they're that, gonna, that's normal. Of course. That's how it should of course. be. And if it's not that way, then maybe we should start to consider about shutting down these social media platforms because that's going to impede progress for humanity. So, But if you're what, listening and watching our podcast, then this is built on proper knowledge, study, and we are here to facilitate a deeper dialogue about deeper knowledge. Mm -hmm. Not as teachers or gurus or anything like that but just as human just as people human to human i don't like people how they like to recite what he says she says yeah no, yeah, no it's not that's so. the how the things operate nowadays yeah. but that's what we all have to avoid because that's not how things are well the online policing of each other individualistically mm. must stop because that's just a byproduct of social media and a byproduct of uh, you being influenced by clever algorithms so if you don't know that then you ought to know that and this online policing of each other or individual policing of each other which has built this inhumane political correctness has to end because that's going to impede progress within humanity but that's a whole deeper conversation which yeah, we, yeah. we can talk about another time about social media and you know if you haven't watched the social dilemma i really recommend you go and watch that but if you if you think that you can come to an understanding of the knowledge that Guy Young and I talk about on this podcast, you probably won't come about that from watching a five minute Sadhguru YouTube clip or or something like this. You have to actually read the text. You have to gain a frame of reference about the knowledge and have a sense of humility about it and yeah. and and defer to the the actual knowledge and learn from it and then i mean there's nothing better right like for you and i like for example like heaven for us people probably don't know this but it's like say for example like living somewhere in bod guy or tiruvannamalai or, or Kathmandu valley and just after meditation in the morning having the whole morning to study and and just that's heaven for us you know it seems simplistic and just eating good food and going for walks and Seems too simple for people because it's like, what about the internet and this and that? Newsflash. Most of the times when we're in India, we don't have the internet. That's why you'll see, like, I won't have a YouTube video for months because it's just like, I'm, I'm living again. <laughs> but, but, you know, like, again, it's a whole other conversation. But it, it is important to make sure that you are studying properly. You are studying the proper traditions. You're not getting some half-baked book on the Mandukya Parishad, go to the actual Vedanta Society 
website and their bookstore and, and see what's there and, and, and if it's too expensive on it. This book's literally like ten ten dollars and it's like a hundred hundred rupee in India. Ten ten Australian dollars. Ten Australian dollars, yeah. It might be like six or seven it's US. hundred I, I remember it was a hundred rupee in India. Hundred rupees you'd be like a a dollar something in US dollars. <laughs> Do- yeah, dollar something, dollar tw- dollar thirty maybe. Two dollars for Australian dollars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um I when I uh, first experienced that the spiritual practices at the monastery I mean I had that like a deep question about like thoughts and mind and things like that what you like what you mentioned earlier what is mind kind of thing Mm. like when I was a child I had like this deep like wonder just a just wonder about like I have ability to think do other people think as well? Like this kind of just a yeah. like really random like innocent sort yeah, of inquiry. Question, yeah, inquiry. Yeah, and then the first uh, time around the uh, experience at the monastery gave me like kind of just life changing experience basically. So the after that experience, I just thought that uh, everyone, everyone, if you're born as a human being should be doing this. Yeah. Why? Because we all have mind mm. and we all have thoughts. Mm. What to to what to do with those is completely up to the individual. Yeah. It's your responsibility to do with um, your own mind and thoughts. Mm. And how you go about um looking at your mind and thoughts will determine your life basically. Mm. Your, is your life going to be based on pure happiness or something else? Yes. And um, I think our humanity's ultimate goal should be uh, being unconditionally being happy, mm. I believe. Mm. And to, to get to that uh, goal, we should be all doing the sincere spiritual practice yes maybe for some people maybe not right now if people believe in reincarnation maybe next life sometime i don't know but eventually eventually no matter what we'll all have to come back to this Mm. and do this work Mm. because there is no way around it otherwise you only just gonna live in misery and suffering, pain. Well, just as the nutrition is important for the body, meditation is important for the mind. And it's just a, an, a more of a collective awareness of that, of how important that is for just your general well-being. We don't have to, you don't even have to get into the deeper elements of meditation, but just like having a, a very basic and generic meditation practice every day for anyone is, is like nutrition for the mind. Mm. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. And it's when Shunro, Zen master Shunro Suzuki was asked by uh, people in San Francisco, American students, and they, he was saying that everyone should meditate because we are, we're all Buddhas. And they're like, no, we can't be. Donald, Donald Trump's a Buddha? <laughs> you know, that, that would be people's questions, right? But they don't understand the deeper elements, right? And it's nothing against Trump. I, I personally don't have anything against anyone. Um, but I'm using him as a frame of reference here because for whatever reason, people, a lot of people don't like him. And so I don't know enough about politics. But um, the original Buddha mind is, is our original face, is our original mind, all of us. It's the basis of our being. And so if that's who we are, as a Buddha, you should meditate. Just as if you're in a body, it's probably best to eat some food because, you know, that's... I'm pretty sure that's how you keep keep being alive. So for your mind to thrive, then you need to meditate more and more and more. Um, and then what happens is the more you meditate, the, the less you have a, a, a grip on your persona, on your sense of self, and the more you come into resonance with something much greater than yourself, something much deeper. And... That's kind of, well, that's the Turiya, that's the Atman. You won't be there probably straight away, mm. but there's a resonance with it. Mm. 
you know what I mean? In Zen, they talk about, for example, in Zen Buddhism, they talk when they talk about the Buddha Buddha mind, they talk about that, or they or when they talk about Satori, I should say, is that anyone can get a glimpse at it. You can have an experience of it. Experience the experience of the bad. You, it's a bad term for that. You can you can feel that mm. that enlightenment state. But the, the difference is between that and say Zen master is they have more of an ability to prolong that state of that ultimate state of consciousness. Let's say the, the Turiya that or the Atman, that, that state of consciousness. So the, the 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 work then is to get from you might have had that state briefly and gone back to your life, but it's about implementing that more daily and being more focused on your practice to abide more in that in, in your everyday life like we were talking about earlier actually yeah you somehow um be in that stay in that state of consciousness in your daily life when you dish washes or when you cook mm. and when you clean the house and mm. this type of thing yeah. yeah, to implement that in the daily life and that uh, make a life meditation yeah, make life meditation mm. exactly because mm. that's what it is right mm. and in saying that make life meditation uh, when you are abiding as the witness and you're observing and you're not identifying with the mind's activity that is meditation mm. so you have a meditative mind yes yeah, you have meditative mind that's right that's mm. the difference between mm. probably the sage and, and us ordinary folk mm. is that your mind is medit, medita- their mind is meditative. Mm. So you're seeing the the bubbles of mind pop up, but you just see it. Mm. It's just there. It's nothing. That's somewhat like uh, in Zen Buddhist, they they say like before enlightenment chopping wood, after enlightenment chopping wood. Yeah, of course, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's the but the daily activity may be the same, but the do doer mm. of activity yeah. is completely different yeah mm. well that's what they say in zen like, like what i was mentioning with satori is that when when you've had that state of consciousness at the beginning it's like wow like mm. how good's this like mm. and then when life comes back it's a bit it can be a bit of a bummer for some people mm. but the ultimate state in zen is what you said is about you've had that experience but you've come back to the world and you have just you are living just in the world ordinarily, and so you you're back to your ordinary mind, but you you've your mind has been in some sense transformed. So the sense of like of the dualistic mind has subsided into this non-dual reality, like where you can function normally as a human, but it's it's done with a different sort of zest and vigor, where you you live from, mm. and you're not kind of handicapped from being who you are mm. you still are a person you know you're a person and you're existing but it, it's no longer a problem you don't suffer your existence anymore you you don't take these the things seriously and you don't attached by this false identification of yourself there's a, there's a phrase in advaita do you experience suffering or do you suffer your experiencing? Mm. You see? Ah, uh, yep. Mm. And which one do we do the most? We, the, the latter. Mm. We suffer our experiencing. Mm. Mm. The experience of suffering essentially comes from the suffering of our own experiencing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's because we're in our own way. We're in our own way. We've built a world, mm. built with built this sense of self about ourselves that essentially keeps us from experiencing life as it truly is and in in a sense is is handicapping our existence whereas the world is always as it is right yeah like how you make of it how you make of it yeah Mm. exactly yeah and when you abide in the Turi or the Atman you experience life just as it is yeah there's not any projection of good or bad, right or wrong. It's all neti neti. It's all not this, not that. Mm. 
No, that's not what it is. That's not what it is. Mm. None of that. No, 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 no. That's all subjective. All subjective. And Toria is beyond all experience, so it isn't. It can never be subjective. And in a sense, it can never be objective too, because there's just no sense of persona, no sense of I. Mm. It's just pure awareness. And that's all what we ought to get back to. Yeah. And that's the heart of the Mandukya Upanishad, the Upanishads, isn't it? Mm. It's a um, challenging goal, but more we get closer to it, more we become happier and blissful and free we, we will be. Exactly. Mm. It can seem like a challenge because it's, it's, it's a pretty, pretty radical way of viewing the world. It's, it's upside down. Upside it's down. very yeah. different. Yeah. But again, like what they mentioned in the Upanishads and like what we mentioned about Zen, is it's not that you are going to disappear and your life is going to disappear. It means that you, you've just come back into contact with your real state of consciousness. And life goes on. You're still operating, drinking tea, you know, mm. playing music mm. or taking the garbage out. Mm. You're still doing everything. Mm. Don't be afraid of that. Mm. That still has to be done, the practicality, the practical things in life. But it's done from a different place. And that place is the true place. And everything that happens is just happening of, its, of itself without a sense of, even in some sense, a sense of personal will. It just, it just, that life just has its way. Mm. Mm. But, and we discard our own personal will and let kind of life take its course. Yep. Right? Yep. And you're somewhat um, passive. Yes. But that being without desires, without a greed, mm. right? Mm. You come from that pure, unstained place. That's what, that's what they say in Shaivism. They say that even if you think that you are operating from your personal will, the only will that's really happening in here is Shiva. Yeah. It's just Shiva's will. Mm. So your spiritual practice is to actually get out of this hypnosis that it's your personal will and you're doing things and this and that and just let Shiva do its thing. Right. Yeah, don't overthink about things. Uh, don't overthink yeah, about yeah. it. If, they, if that's what you trigger to do, Right, then just go and do it. Just go and do it, yeah. Mm. Not over analyze. You don't have to strategize or analyze no, no, or no, 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 no. none of that. It just it has its way. Yeah. And what you realize from the Turiya and the Atman is there's just an energy in life that just does its thing. Yeah. Without your conscious participation. Think about this, when you die, life's gonna go on. Yeah. That's right. World will function as usual. Yeah. Without anyone. <laughs> anyone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. She's gonna do its thing. Yeah. All humans could die in the all humans could die in the world. Yeah. Plants still gonna do its thing. Animals are still gonna do its thing. The clouds are still gonna move around. Yes. That's right. Then it's meaningless and pointless to put too much of attachment in things that we give too much meaning. That's all subjective. Exactly. Mm. You're only dwelling in, again, the waking, the dreaming, the dreamless sleep state of consciousness. You're not in the Turiya. Mm. When you're in the Turiya, you just let Shiva do its thing. Yeah. And when you let Shiva do its thing, everything, in some sense, comes back into harmony mm. with, the way, with the way things actually are. Yeah. That's right. When you uh, put your own will to it, then that's... Kind of, you're disrupting that harmony. You're disrupting that harmony. You're yeah. interfering with the stream. That's right. You're swimming against the mm -hmm. stream of the Tao. Let go. Let the Tao's power become your power. Mm -hmm. That's essentially what you're doing. You're, you're giving up your own will for sh to let Shiva or Brahman or Tao, whatever you want to call it, you use its will through you. Yeah. And whatever happens, happens. That's it. That's life, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, guys, I hope you enjoyed that today. Remember, go out and get yourself a copy, Mandukya Upanishad. Uh, get this version, actually, translated by Swami Nikulananda. And anything else you want to add? Um, you have the article that you wrote about Turiya. Oh, yeah. I have the Go Beyond Everything Turiya. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. In, uh, yeah. You can get this, actually, a copy at, of New Dawn at yeah, New Dawn's magazine. website. Magazine. Yeah. yeah. And... 
actually, I have a video. Oh. Go beyond Turia. I'll Thanks. put I'll put the link actually at yeah, the end of this video. This so go out and get yourself a copy. Remember, but remember if you're yeah, well, get that copy of the magazine of New Dawn, and make sure to study Turia thoroughly. Get get yourself a translation of this from Swami Nikolananda. Also get yourself a self knowledge at my boulder by Swami Nikolananda, and also the Vavika Chudamani by uh, Shankara. I mean, you could get the Upanishads and read the whole Upanishads as well. Or but I think that the separate uh, books are more thorough. They're, they're more thorough. Mm. Yeah, yeah, more study. in depth. Eh? Well, exactly. Well, exactly. You got Gaut Gautapada's Karika and also Shankara's commentary in this. Yes. So, so you could have the you could read the Upanishads, but if you have no frame of reference yeah. for what the Upanishads are, yeah, and what they're, they're explained, then you need to read these sorts of texts. And actually, like what you said, these are actually. I feel better getting the individual mm -hmm. ones, but you know, there's many Upanishads. But to understand, ad especially Advaita Vedantic knowledge, these are very important. And again, online there's plenty of stuff from the Vedanta Society, right? The Ramakrishna Mission and all of that sort of knowledge. And you have to really be able to discern, though, between Neo Advaita and proper Advaita Vedanta knowledge, which is a whole other topic. But um, this is very important for all people who are interested in any sort of consciousness study. You have to be studying uh, the Turi. You have to be studying Advaita Vedanta. If you're interested in Taoism and Buddhism, you should be studying Advaita Vedanta as well because this is going to, again, accentuate your understanding. Remember, a lot of people ask us, like, how did you guys get so much knowledge and so forth and so on? It's like, not by studying one tradition, but by studying all of the traditions. We like to look at everything. Everything. And <laughs> they all actually uh, lean in on each other. Yeah, that's and why it's just fascinating. You just can't stop looking at different things, right? Yeah, Because they all, they all coincide. It all coincides. Yeah. And that comes back to Asian history, the evolution of spirituality in Asia and... Mm. Uh, the cognitive style in Asia as well, the holistic cognitive style. So, right. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed. It was a real good one, and mm -hmm. we'll see you guys next week.